Welcome to the Natural Super Kids Podcast, where you will discover practical strategies to inspire you to boost the health and nutrition of your kids. I'm Jessica Donovan, a qualified naturopath specializing in kids' health, and I want to make it as easy as possible for you to raise healthy and happy kids. Let's get into it. Hello, hello. Welcome back to the Natural Super Kids podcast. Jessica Donovan here. And this episode is for you mamas who have young babies, who might not be sleeping or have some sleep challenges. So today I am joined by Fiona from Mama Matters. And Fiona is a social worker by trade and has worked in perinatal mental health and parenting for most of her career. And with that experience, she has developed a signature style of honest parenting support. So Fiona's approach is to empower parents to shift from the traditional sleep training culture and honor their babies as little individuals. And in this episode, Fiona shares some of the most common sleep issues that she supports parents with. Um, She talks about how she's shaking up the mistruths when it comes to the mainstream sleep industry. And we all know there are so many of them. Um, She shares her advice for parents who are currently in the trenches of broken sleep. And we talk a bit about the circle of security approach when it comes to parenting and sleep as well. It's a great conversation. um, And I know those of you who are in the trenches, you know, a broken sleep with little babies are going to appreciate Fiona's really common sense and down to earth approach to both sleep and parenting. So here's Fiona. Welcome to the podcast, Fiona. So happy to have you here. Thank you, Jess. It's lovely to be here. So can you start by telling us a little bit about yourself and what you offer over at Mama Matters? Sure. So I am a social worker by trade. I spent the majority of my career working with mums and babies in hospital setting and then in the early intervention parenting setting in the community. And throughout that work and through the journey of having my own babies, I was starting to realise some of these gaps in the in the ways that we support mums and babies and some stuff that just didn't quite add up, particularly around baby sleep. Started doing my own research. I ended up doing a um, baby-led sleep certification on my maternity leave with my daughter. And from there, I started Mama Matters on the side and then went into it full-time last year. So I provide early parenting and sleep support for parents who are um, wanting to um, wanting to parent responsibly who want some evidence-based information and um, a little bit of support um, in anything to do with their parenting, really. So it's mainly around sleep, but it, I also focus a lot on reflective parenting and responsive parenting. Beautiful. So, so needed, you know, this, so needed. <laughs> this parenting gig. None of us really know what we're doing, do we? <laughs> I know, we were just talking about that, weren't we? <laughs> we were, yes. Just when you think you've got a handle on things, you kid goes and changes and you back to the books. Yes, exactly. And so, you know, like like at Natural Super Kids, it's this constant kind of journey. It's not like we reach this place where, you know, we've got it all figured out, is it? Yeah, they keep us on our toes, don't they? They certainly yeah. do. So Especially so what are some of years. Yeah, 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 yeah. Um, so what are some of the common issues that you support parents with over at Mama Matters? I, I mean, you mentioned sleep, but mm. sort of the specific challenges. Yeah, so sleep is the big one, but it's half the time it's not actually about sleep challenges. It's more about challenges um, around sleep, if that makes sense, like anxiety around sleep. Um looking for to feel confident and reassured around sleep, mm-hmm. just feeling overwhelmed and confused with all of the conflicting advice out there because, God, if you Google like when your baby will sleep through the night, you will be hit with all of these 
uh, different people telling you different things about when your baby should sleep through the night, what's going wrong if your baby isn't sleeping through the night. You'll suddenly go into this Google rabbit hole. You go into a shame spiral. What am I doing wrong? What's my baby doing wrong? Where have I gone so wrong? And so that's where I come in a lot of the time in helping people to relax around sleep, like knowing that they're not doing a disservice to their baby by not teaching them to sleep independently a certain way that the books tell them that they have to. A lot of it is about um, kind of dissecting or pulling apart the perfect mum myth and working around like where does that come from? Why do you feel like you need to have your baby sleeping that way? Or Mm -hmm. what comes up for you when your baby doesn't sleep? So that's what I'm talking about as well when I'm saying that I I do sleep, but it's so much more than sleep. And a lot of it is about parenting reflectively and pushing back against some of this mainstream advice that makes us feel like shit and um, tuning into what, how we want to parent because we get to choose how we want to parent. And I think as long as it's safe and it's respectful and it feels right, it's a Pinky McKay quote, is it safe, is it respectful, does it feel right, then we get to do what we want mm-hmm. parenting and around sleep. So giving people permission to do things their way can feel really liberating. Yes, I love that because there's so much information that's just unrealistic, isn't there, you know? So much. And most of it's just made up. Yeah. (laughs) Like people can make up a lot of stuff online. Mm -hmm. And it leads to us feeling like failures as parents if our babies aren't sleeping through the night as one kind of prime example by a certain age. Um, Mm. yeah. So I love that you're talking about this. So one of the things that you're passionate about, and I think we've already sort of alluded to this is shaking up the mistruths when Mm. it comes to the mainstream sleep industry. So could you share with us the most common advice that you see in the mainstream or the most common information that you see, um, and why you believe that this does need to be sort of shaken up? Mm. So most of it, most of our sleep advice that we get is from this behavioral paradigm, the behavioral wave of psychology that happened um, a while ago, but still just hangs around, particularly around sleep. So if you don't like a behavior, you ignore it or you like you think about negative, positive consequences or um, yeah, it's, a, it's about seeing a behavior you don't like and squishing it through a behavioral lens, but it doesn't really take into account uh, attachment theory or developmental psychology. So it's it doesn't see baby sleep as a relationship between a parent and a baby or a parent and a child. Um, it sees sleep as the problem and sleep is in a vortex and we'll fix that sleep problem. And so what happens is we think we have a problem. We think our baby's catnapping. We have to look that up and we have to fix it. So we look up our baby's catnapping and somewhere along the way, somebody decided that a short nap was a problem. Mm-hmm. <laughs> so then you research it and it tells you you must teach your baby to link sleep cycles. So then you go on this journey of trying to get your baby to sleep, to link sleep cycles. So it's just like I, I feel like people who are not of um, not in our Western culture would listen to this and they're like, what are they, like why are they so um, focused on this stuff? But then you then it sets you up for failure because you, it's really hard to reach these like ideal goals of how your baby should sleep, where they should sleep, how long they should sleep, how they fall asleep, all of these things. So it's setting you up for failure that I am falling short, I'm not doing a good enough job, I am, I, I'm not cut out for this, all because your baby took a short nap, which is probably just what they needed to get on with their day. Mm. So it's all of this advice that feels... Uh, minimal when you look at it on its own but when you are completely surrounded by it you are overwhelmed by it all of it conflicts with each other it just like it just doesn't have to feel so hard it really doesn't have to be so complicated and so hard and I want to bring people back to their back to their values and back to their instinct and respond to their babies and um, experiment like experiment you read a cue you try to respond in a certain way and see how that lands and that's how you get your confidence in your parenting does that make sense I feel like I went on a 
Yes, it definitely does. And it's like, you know, we're because we've got so much information at our fingertips, right? Which can be positive in one way, but it can lead us down all these rabbit holes of made up information that's just put out on the internet. And it takes us away from tuning into what feels right for us, our own intuition, doesn't it? So that's yes. And tuning into your child in front of you as well. Like if you're reading a book that says your baby should be sleeping for 12 hours overnight and two two hour naps a day. But your baby genuinely only needs 10 hours of sleep in a 24-hour period. Are, are you going to just spend the rest of your days just patting and shushing in a darkened room trying to get this t- baby who is telling you quite clearly, I am not tired, I don't need to sleep. But then all of that advice will say, well, they're hard to put down because they must be overtired. You must be missing their wake windows. Mm-hmm. You must be missing that sweet spot. So it just like it's so, I, I mean, I've I've been there. I can see how easily you can go down that rabbit hole and I I wonder like you were there a little bit further ago I wonder how much has changed even since then you've got a a 12 year old and a 14 year old that's yeah I I wonder if it's even more intense now with I guess Instagram and more information at our fingertips well that's right I mean I I think you know I only started my Facebook account I mean I didn't have a Facebook account when my son was born 14 and a bit years ago um so yeah we didn't have as much information at our fingertips but I do remember you know reading the books he wasn't a great sleeper I was exhausted and you know trying all of these things that didn't really work well for us before settling on hang on a minute you know let's let me just do this how I you know feel is right um and it was a long time ago so <laughs> you know the <laughs> memory isn't um isn't all that clear but i do remember things changing for the good when i just kind of went with with what i felt was right like we it causes yeah. so much more stress doesn't it for for yeah. us if we're trying to follow a certain way of doing things that clearly isn't working yeah absolutely it isn't working for us and it doesn't suit our individual unique little human that we have in front of us too and that's the fun of like being in relationship with someone is getting to know them mm. and finding what works you know your own dance of attachment what works for you guys as a family together as well so true so we're missing you know like if we're so yeah. caught up in getting the right information and doing everything right by the book or the blog or the podcast that we might be listening to um then we are like we're missing out on that on that connection and that yeah you know, parts of that relationship yeah yeah yeah, yeah. Agree. Yeah. And so you talk about the circle of security um, quite a bit. So can you share more with our listeners about what the circle of security is and how this approach can support both parents and children? Yeah. So circle of security is a parenting program. It's not my parenting program. It's an internationally renowned one. It is a group program that helps to provide us with a framework to make sense of our child's attachment needs. So through the circle of security, it's if you can envision a a literal circle or it's an oval on its side, um, and to the left of that oval is the hands and you as the parent or the caregiver are the hands on the circle. Your job is to be bigger, stronger, wiser and kind and to follow your child's lead whenever possible and whenever necessary, take charge. So all throughout the days, all throughout life, our children leave the hands on the circle, so the um, secure base and safe haven, and they go out on the top of the circle to explore their world. And then when they have um, a new set of needs, they come in on the bottom of the circle to have their emotional needs met. So they need our support just as much as they are going out on the top of the circle as they are coming in on the bottom of the circle. So the circle of security helps us to recognise where our kids are in the circle at that time. Are they happy and out exploring their world and is it a watch over them moment or a delight in them moment, enjoy with them moment? Or are they they on the bottom of the circle where they need to have their emotional cups filled or to have their feelings organised? So sometimes if we are, it's it's our job as caregivers to try to attune to our child's needs, right? But we don't need to get it right all of the time. And that's what's in that um, to and fro relationship. That's the trial and error, flexibly experimenting, seeing how, you know, things land. So that's how we learn what our, our kids need. But what we want is 
for our kids to know that they are safe and supported to go out and explore their world. So explore their independence, explore other relationships. Um, yeah, just, you know, explore their world around us. Um, and as babies, that might just be looking around the room. That might just be when we are trying to engage with our babies and they look away from us, respecting that they are going out and exploring the world and waiting for them to come back in instead of following them around Mm -hmm. (laughs) and trying to pull them back in. So that's what that can look like, um, you know, in infancy. And then as toddlers, you literally see them come sit on your lap, get their emotional cup filled, and then they go out around the circle, go and explore some toys, you know, go and play with whatever, and then they come back in and have their emotional cup filled or maybe they need their feelings organized. So it just gives this really beautiful visual framework and a shared language to use around working out where our kids are at and what their emotional or attachment needs are instead of just seeing the behavioral stuff on the outside. So unlike a a program that might be, um, you know, steps one, two, three to curb unwanted behavior, which is that real behavioral focus, it would be more about seeing the the child in front of you and making sense of what they need in that moment, filling up their emotional cup, making sure the connection is strong because all of this change and growth and development happens in the context of relationships. So we need to start there. Yes, you've explained that so well. And I I, I didn't do the, the you know, the circle of security um, parenting course, but I did do a parenting course where my kids were much littler that talked about this. And I just found that that visualization so helpful because I had a very, and still my son, who's the older one, is much more independent and he can kind of go, he's got a much bigger circle and he's always has had. Whereas my daughter, who's obviously now that she's 12, has got a much bigger circle than she did. But, you know, she was always very clingy and needy and just envisioning that she just had a smaller circle and she needed to come back for refueling so much more um, frequently than my son did. And that that's okay. Like they're all different. Yeah, they are. And just being able to make sense of that for you would have been so helpful instead of, as we would say, trying to put her back on the top of the circle yes. because that's only going to create further Never disconnect. worked. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> yeah. So you've got to meet her where she's at, give her what she needs, and then, you know, support her exploration rather than trying to put her back out there as we often do when it's – because it can also be triggering for us, yeah. right? If we have not been welcomed in on the circle in certain parts as kids, then – they are often the the sticky bits where we get, where we get triggered. triggered as parents. Yeah. Yes. So if we weren't really welcome um, to bring our big feelings to our parents, maybe if we were really angry but we didn't feel like we could do that, that was punished, we'd sent to our room or, you know, girls don't get angry, all that kind of stuff. When our kids get angry, that might trigger something in us that we call our shark music in Circle of Security. Mm. That's, a, that's a Jaws music. Duh, duh. Mm-hmm. <laughs> and so we might react in ways that we don't want to um, because we are responding to, we're reacting to those past experiences. So circle of security helps us to make sense of the ways in which we were parented as well so that we can intentionally respond rather than instinctively react. Yes, definitely. And so common like in uh, you know, in our generation, well, I'm I'm like 44, so I think I'm I'm a, probably a generation like further ahead than you. Um, but really? I'm yeah. just like we were, <laughs> we weren't. You know, like it was very common for um, us not to kind of be encouraged to share emotion, right? Like, stop yeah. crying, don't be silly, it's fine. Yeah, um, yeah. and the right. girls don't get angry and boys don't cry and all of that stuff was pretty much like across the board, right? And now we're trying to parent from a different place in, an, in, an, in a different way. So those triggers can come up. Um, so I love that you've brought that up because I think, you know, this whole parenting gig is the the biggest kind of journey of self-development we'll go on, right? Yes. <laughs> That and starting a business. <laughs> yeah, that's right. Those two. <laughs> we're, we're both doing both. <laughs> yeah, exactly. It is. And and it's it would be really nice if, if our intentions alone were enough, but sometimes we do need to just do the work and practice to break that circuitry that might come more instinctively in order to be able to really, um, yeah, be intentional about the way that we 
raise our kids. And like I said, we're not going to get it right all the time. Circle of security is just one way of reflecting on our own parenting and the ways in which we were parented. But yeah, it's it's definitely we definitely don't have to be perfect, and that is a real um, one of the stronger messages in circle of security as well. That good enough is good enough. Yes, I love that, and it's even very um, relevant now for me. Like on the weekend, my fourteen year old had a rare day of being home. It was awful weather. My daughter was out, and he said, "Do you want to watch a movie with me, Mum?" And like, so that's him coming in to, it's you know, like, yeah, yeah. I was like, uh, yeah. like, <laughs> you know, I wasn't really keen on the movie he chose, but I sat there for two and a half hours watching a sci-fi movie. With oh, him. two and a half hours too. That's brutal. <laughs> Actually, I enjoyed it more than I thought I would, but it's that. You know, I think because he he's nearly fifteen, so I'm seeing the the separation, and this is kind of very different from the topic of of, of this podcast. Um, but you know, it's like I've got to make the most of the these moments, but they still come back for that connection, even as they get so much older. Yeah, and so do we. We might call our parents on the yes. phone when something exciting happens, so or it's you know we have the circle of security with our partners as well. It just looks a little bit different, but that's. That's a, a part of a secure attachment is having that secure base. So that can look, you know, that can transfer to relationships and our own parents as well. Yeah, definitely. Such a good point. Yeah. So uh, do you have any advice for parents out there that are, you know, in the trenches of, of broken sleep and, you know, all of the the fatigue and um irritability and so much more than that 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 can bring like what advice would you give to those parents I'm reluctant to give too much advice because there's too much out there but my advice would be don't listen to everything you hear Mm. and don't believe everything you read and sometimes we need to be able to protect our space especially online to stop following all of the sleep accounts stop following all of the health accounts like pick a few who you trust and know and like and stick to that and so and and just tune into yourself a little bit I'm not going to say trust your intuition or follow your instincts because that can feel pretty like what does that even mean yes but just um like why don't you just give it a go why don't you just you know experiment and use a bit of trial and error and just see what happens as opposed to looking to the books for every little thing that comes up because sleep, it, it really doesn't have to feel this hard. It doesn't have to be this complicated. Someone just along the way has made it like that mm-hmm. and we've stuck with it. Yes. And it's not like, you know, it's not normal for babies to sleep through the night either. You no, know, it's, it's very not. normal for babies to be waking through the night. Yeah. Normal and protective for them as well. Like that's yeah. how they're made. And that that's one of the things that, things that bothers me is that, you know, catnapping is so bad and night waking is so bad but then why are they all doing it Mm. (laughs) why do babies Mm. do it yeah they're not all broken no that's so true yeah yeah I mean we are parenting in a a a society that doesn't support families as much as it should doesn't honor the time it takes to raise a baby or the um like how many people it takes to raise a baby Mm -hmm. we're not part of the village anymore so there is uh, a certain compromise that has to happen along the way in order to be able to support everyone in the family. But yeah, definitely. So, um, can you tell our listeners where they can find out more about you and you know how you can help or how how you work with people? Yeah, sure. So my um, I, I hang out on Instagram probably mostly at mama matters dot au m a m a matters dot au. And I can help anybody with uh, one-to-one sleep support or uh, I run circle security groups regularly online. And I have a bunch of like little workshops and mini courses too on things like rupture and repair and night weaning and starting childcare and napsiety, which is the big one that when people feel a bit stressed about sleep, that's a good place to start. So mm-hmm. and I've got some um, sleep guides coming out over the next couple of weeks too. So awesome. I can help got lots happening and all of the all of that information I'm imagining is on your website so yes. mamamatters.com.au 
Beautiful. And we'll make sure that we link to Fiona's website and your Instagram. I certainly see your face pop up on Instagram fairly regularly. (laughs) But I just love the work you do. So thank you so much for coming here and assuring our listeners that, you know, that it's probably fairly, you know, normal what they're going through um, with babies and sleep. um, And yeah, they can come on over and check your stuff out for um yeah that support so thanks so much thank you so much Jess thanks for having me bye Fiona thank you so much for joining me on the podcast today head on over to our website naturalsuperkids.com for the show notes for this episode as well as a whole heap of inspiration to help you raise healthy and happy kids I'll see you next week